Dr. Ahmad, professor in the iSchool and Vicar coordinator. If you have any questions or comments you'd like to share after the conference, feel free to contact me in world or send an email. Some of you may wonder what Vicara is. Vakara is the Virtual Center for Archives and Records Administration, which originally occupied one-third of Swiss Island. It's now the Ice School Island. The other two sections were set aside for an IMLS grant on youth librarianship and courses in virtual worlds. The IMLS grant has been completed and the courses are no longer running. Vakara has been deeded those spaces. Vakara and the Ice School Island is a constantly evolving space, adapting to changing needs and interests of the school and its students. However, our basic goals remain the same. To provide a space for faculty and staff and students to exchange information, communicate, and collaborate. To provide networking opportunities and meet invited guests to provide space to showcase accomplishments of students, to support continuing professional development, and to promote the benefits and importance of what I call record keeping from creation of the record, such as our virtual objects, through permanent storage in an archive. Although it bears re little resemblance now, Vaccaro was loosely modeled after Trajan's Forum in Rome, Italy, which combined both Roman and Greek architectural elements. Today, Trajan's Forum is almost completely dis disseminated, decimated. <laughs> The picture uh, that you see depicts what was left of Trajan's markets, which were shown on the lower right of the design of the forum that we created here originally. In 2009, the original Vaccaro space had some resemblance to the Trajan forum in that it was designed as a rectangle and had both Greek and Roman buildings labeled exhibit halls on the image that you see. In addition, a lecture hall called the Roman Senate was used for guest lectures, and a tavern around the back was used for parties. Two faculty offices were built one for Preceptor Ahmet and one for visiting professors. The event space was a spa-like structure and the little chain was hidden behind an orange grove. Today, many of the original buildings have been replaced with structures more suitable to our activities and interests. 
The Archivium is a museum of sorts, storing machinima from all seven previous conferences and artifacts from courses that were held on the island. Please come back to explore when you have a chance. The museum structure houses traveling exhibits. If you have time, enjoy the current exhibit, The Prince of Wales, Flawed Royalty and the Joy of Political Cartooning. The space set aside for virtual world classes is now Vapara Village, rem reminiscent of uh, the early Boston city. Use for the third section under investigation. Team members are allowed to select a dwelling in Vicar. Now, last year, Main Street was the set of a video that included a fire-eating dragon. Today, it is the site of our first Vicar screen quest. Archival Nightmare in Colonial Boston. I'll turn the mic over now to iSchool student and Papara member Elise Donovan Jones for a special announcement about the Papara Screen Quest before we begin our program. Elise? Hi, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get up at the little podium here. Yes, I'll be very brief because uh, I am sure Letty would like to start on her keynote. Uh, so, uh, as Pat said, um, I am Elise, and I'm a Vicarin. I'm a member of the Vicar Student Group, and I'm also an MLIS student at the iSchool. Uh, first, I'd like to ask everyone to participate in the conference on social media uh, using hashtag Vicara. And I'll be live tweeting as Vicara's avatar, Namasani Seminario, and that's uh, Namasani SL on Twitter. And I've also got a link here. You can uh, follow us on Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, and also through our blog. And I have a post up with our different social media channels if you'd like to follow us there. And then also, if you're interested in the full schedule for tonight's conference, um, go ahead and check out the Vicara blog. I've put a link to the schedule there. And then uh, I'm also proud to announce the Vicara Quest. It's our first Scream Quest. It's going to be May 8th. Uh, it's going to be our first official launch tour. And it'll be at 6 p.m. And uh, Scream stands for Students Creating Real Archival Memories. And this quest is going to be Archival Nightmare in Colonial Boston. It takes place in the Boston Build, which is also the Vicara Village. And that's where our free student housing is. And uh, also exciting, the quest is now open for anyone who would like to preview and test it for us. Uh, so we have some a couple of rocks to either side with balloons over top of them. Uh, feel free to click on that for a note card that has the URL for the quest on it. Uh, and then uh, please return May 8th to 6 p.m., second lifetime, of course, uh, for an official tour of the quest. It'll be led by me, and then uh, we have a couple other students that helped create the quest that, that should also be there. So, yeah, we're really excited. Um, so uh, that's it for me, um, and I'll go ahead and I will let uh, Pat introduce our first keynote speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce the first keynote. Dr. Leticia de Leon, Letty Luckstone. Her topic is motivating learning through mixed realities. Letty, take it away. Thank you, Pat. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm just going to take a moment here to move my uh, screen forward a bit. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this event. Those of us who use virtual environments like Second Life for teaching or training are attempting to take advantage of one key factor, the novelty of immersion. 
However, this cannot be maintained without some thoughtful design behind the activities. Today, I will propose the possibilities for mixed realities to motivate learning. The theme of this conference seems to be rather appropriate in that space and time together define reality as we move through our lives. Without getting deep into physics, which is not my forte, consider the implications of that when it comes to mixed realities and the immersion possibility. To be invested in any one experience, moment, or situation, be it for fun, learning, or work, you must be immersed in it in order to be engaged. But you can't be immersed in it unless you create a visceral and emotional connection that at least appears partially real or real to you. That's why we, be we begin our story on mixed realities. The term itself has actually been around for a lot longer than some people realize. And the diagram on the current slide shows how it was first described. This description is accurate and appropriate today as it was over 20 years ago. At the, at the middle of this continuum is actually a mixture of realities, and Second Life is somewhere between augmented virtual, virtuality and virtual reality. If high fidelity truly delivers on the facial recognition and body tracking movement, it would actually be closer to the virtual reality that Milgram and Cascino described. Thus far, that type of VR is only possible in fictionalized accounts like Snow Crash. I do want to take a moment to define the terms though. Augmented reality is a real world overlaid with virtual elements. This has been around much longer than the Pokemon craze would seem to suggest. Augmented virtuality is a virtual world overlaid with real world components. We do this with Second Life all the time, when we use media on a print to play a real world video. And even now as I present this using my own voice over Vivox to make it seem like this avatar is the one talking. So why isn't Second Life strictly defined as virtual reality? Primarily, it is the level of immersion possible with VR, which typically requires the use of a wearable device like Oculus. It is, to put it bluntly, an attack on the senses. Full virtual immersion requires that we fool our bodies into believing that we are truly in this created environment. For instance, in the continuum above, I use an image of the Eiffel Tower. The screenshot of the game Ingress also uses the Eiffel Tower to augment the reality. Let's imagine that we want to extend that same example to the extreme of that continuum so that it becomes a full virtual reality setting. I would expect not just three-dimensional realistic images, but also the feeling of craning my neck, my head up to see the sheer size of it, hear the softening of the breeze go through the line of the trees, and hear the multi-language bustle of other fellow tourists, and the emotional reaction to the marble of architecture before us. I need to feel physically and emotionally there. That's presence, and many of you have heard of this before. Well, this same structure can be fully recreated in its physical form in Second Life, and I believe it has. It would require a great deal of imagination from the visitor to experience presence strongly enough to feel there. I'm not discounting this as it is possible, but it requires a bigger personal investment on our abilities to suspend disbelief. A truly immersive VR experience would do all of that for us by feeding all of our senses with stimuli. The point of the previous slides was to simply outline the parameters of currently available mixed realities. While we may only be close to a full VR experience, the current mixed realities still have power all their own to immerse us in learning. This mixing of mediums have the potential for creating the sense of space and time of an experience 
in order to make immersion possible. It is mediated by technology because we can't really mix the virtual with the real unless an app or a headset can create that illusion for us. Is this very illusion, it is this very illusion that provides the possibilities. It's the attention getter, the unexpected novelty of the experience. While many technologies and applications begin by enticing us, many do not often sustain our attention beyond the initial novelty. So how do you get past the novelty factor? This is where motivation comes in. My presentation is about motivating learning. So any propositions I make about what is appropriate must be framed in a particular context. First, let's establish the audience. What motivates adults is not the same as what motivates children, or more generally, K-12 students. Maturation and self-actualization have a great deal to do with this difference. Malcolm Knowles first proposed the concept of andragogy in the 1960s, and when he described the adult learner, he talked about how life and job changes are priorities about what we want or need to learn. This comparison of pedagogy and andragogy illustrates the essential differences of a learner in school grades versus adult learners who are making choices about how to advance their professional lives. These differences in context also change the way we use mixed realities to motivate either group of learners. They each have different thresholds for what constitutes a novelty and how long that attraction lasts. Consider this. When children get introduced to a mixed reality environment, they don't ask why. But when adults get introduced to one, the first question is, how is this useful or valuable to me? Those of us that have been in Second Life for a while have found a personal value or usefulness to the environment, which is why we stay. In the next few, few slides, I will be proposing conditions for motivation that can be intentionally considered when designing learning experiences with mixed realities. A great deal of the research that has informed them comes from framing it through Knowles' andragogy assumptions about how adults learn. In my research with adult learners, I have discovered the following conditions for motivating learning. Connectedness, need, relevance, meaningfulness, competence. These concepts do not necessarily have an order to them, which is why I chose to represent a relationship to each other in a free form of floating bubbles that interact in random and unpredictable ways. The image is static, but picture for a moment fast moving items in constant motion, spinning, racing, and affecting each other. One of the conditions for motivation is connectedness. Adults seek connectedness in an experience, and if you are going to use mixed realities, you can't isolate them to do the learning alone, no matter how pretty and novel it may be. This, this human element is the primary reason for the power of presence. Our existence in the virtual, our small slice of time and space, moves with others. The connectedness element can come in different forms creating a community of people, establishing mentoring relationships, joining together in a common cause, or creating a collaborative project. In this slide, I stole a couple of the VWBP banners that our wonderful webmaster iSky created during the conference. They are compilations of badges people wore during the conference and which Callie Dale, our official photographer, took while mingling with everyone. There are two points I'm trying to make here. The first is that even in a conference using mixed realities in virtual environment, everyone has an identity selected and displayed on a wearable badge, and whatever image they may choose to identify with is irrelevant next to the unspoken message. I am here and I matter. The second point is made by the banners themselves, as well as by the goals of the conference itself, and one that I do my best to uphold as one of its executive uh, directors building community and facilitating networking opportunities. 
The conference has endured for 10 years under this goal, and in exit survey after exit survey we put out, people always say they want more opportunities to network, more ways to connect to others, to meet across common topics. That is connectedness at work. Another condition for motivation is need. Adults seek to fulfill a need. While well, this is one of the biggest motivating elements for adults, it is also the most complex and sometimes the most elusive. Mixed realities cannot fulfill a need unless you design it with intentionality. And you can only design with intentionality if you understand your target audience well enough to meet their needs. I'm going to borrow a little bit from Maslow's uh, humanistic views of need. His original hierarchy had only five levels, but he wanted to publish an updated version of it that he was never able to do. He wanted to add a self-transcendence level to the top of the pyramid, although some online sources create a full pyramid that includes eight levels. These are largely conjecture based on his personal papers and some remarks he made in presentations. Regardless of updates, the need for self-actualization is rather high on the hierarchy. This is the ability to achieve our full potential in whatever our area of interest may be. For adults, this is usually the core of a chosen career path, the thing you do with your life that fulfills your soul and your brain. Mixed realities often fulfill other needs as well, but if you will be using them to motivate learning, that means that whatever knowledge you have to impart should explicitly communicate to the individual how it will fulfill a need they have. How will it fill a void? Children do not have the developmental maturity to understand need at this level. And while adults understand it, they are not always adept at giving it a name. So how do you fulfill need as a condition for motivating learning? You create experiences with mixed realities that target a particular demographic of adult learner and promote it as value added to their professional lives and personal growth. I will give you a second life example. The whole, group, uh, the whole brain group on Inspiration Island are addressing the needs of a target demographic. Individuals who seek, to, uh, who seek to age gracefully, maintain cognitive sharpness, and live purposeful lives even after retirement. Activities all are promoted to fulfill that need for that demographic, arguably, arguably a difficult demographic to attract in this environment. But they do so with intentionality, so that all activities, resources, and events keep a steady engagement that lasts beyond the novelty of first entering the environment. Relevance is another key aspect of motivating the adult learner, in particular relevance to their professional areas. In mixed reality learning, the relevance comes in the topic setup. Information is ubiquitous, but if it is also set up in a cute or gimmicky way, it may turn off some adult learners. A similar situation arises when using mixed realities to gamify instruction. Most fail at gamifying appropriately because they do not include relevance to the individual. Once the novelty wears off, so does the interest and motivation. Adult learners are already motivated to want to learn, so they are not always quick to buy into just any game. If a learner is primarily motivated by relevance, the initial novelty of the mixed reality experience will wear off very quickly or not be present at all. This is where we tend to find the skeptics, those that look at new technologies or even Second Life with suspicion. I sometimes use Second Life with some of my pre-service teachers. The first reaction is almost always skepticism. They don't see how a fake environment is going to help them learn how to become better teachers in real classrooms. They don't see the relevance to their chosen profession because they buy into the misconception that all virtual environments are games and they don't have time for games. So in order to give them relevance, I created a simulated school with real world problem scenarios that help them hone skills they will use in actual real classrooms. 
The mixture of realities needs to be such that it enriches their learning enough to give them the relevance they need to spend time at it. The next condition for motivation is meaningfulness. While we may all be moved by thoughtful sayings, these feelings tend to be fleeting and very rarely incite action beyond the moment. To make people truly believe that what they are undertaking adds meaning to their lives in ways that are beyond the relevant, you need to tap the root of their passions, what makes them feel wholly alive. This is meaningfulness. In some ways, this is really about establishing presence when you immerse in an experience. And ama the amazing potential of mixed realities is for the individual not just to visualize, but to feel, sometimes on a visceral level, what you would feel in an actual, real environment. All the studies about presence in Second Life or any number of virtual environments and simulations are really defining how a person immersed, immerses to such a degree that they can feel the adrenaline, the pleasure, the pain, and all other emotions in between. The key word in this quote is passion. I would like to add one more concept to the idea of meaningfulness, and it comes from Mihai Mikchin's, gosh, I, I practiced this name. Let me try that again. Uh, Mihai Chiksen Mihai. He defined the concept of flow. Flow is a state of complete and total absorption in a task so that you close out everything else except you in the experience. If you enjoy seeing musicians practice their craft, you will have seen the flow state. This is the state that game designers try to tap from the very psyche of a player, and they do it surprisingly well. This is why the gaming industry also employs psychologists, or a branch of them that is sometimes known as happiness engineers. However, many mixed reality environments are not games, and they do not necessarily play upon the adult psyche the same way that a game would. Despite Linden Lab's invitation to play Second Life, it isn't a game, although you can design the environment to help adults find their flow state to immerse not just with their eyes on a computer screen, but with their emotions. The last condition for motivation that I will discuss is competence. Success is seductive and can be addictive. It also motivates individuals to persist in difficult or challenging tasks. No one likes hitting his or her head against a wall, and some mixed reality technologies or applications, like Second Life, for instance, have steep learning curves. Repeated failure is the fastest route to try toward giving up. This is one aspect of motivation that adults share with children, though with some contextual differences. This is where design in a mixed reality setting is very important. You need to create a scaffold for learning the technology and lay down an easy to follow path with small successes along the way. One of my favorite ways to introduce students to Second Life is having them complete the Virtual Abilities Newly tutorial area. It is low in anxiety, allows for some risk-free practice in a scaffolded success path. This is the same concept that multiplayer games use as the onboarding experience to the new player. They basically gradually ease the player through the interface, the interactions, until level by level, success has been attained multiple times, though with enough difficulty to keep it interesting. The same onboarding example should be designed when gamifying a learning environment, especially a mixed reality one. Adding a few superficial reward systems and competition is not enough to motivate the adult learner if the task is simply too difficult. This is also why the concept of the community gateway is very important. Second life is difficult and it assails the senses the first time you land in world. Well, this is an example of onboarding. It isn't an example of one in a mixed reality. For gateways to be more purposeful, however, they would need to target specific audience demographics, not just the generic ones. While learning to walk and talk will make the new user feel competent, 
It will not sustain them past the novelty phase if they don't also see a relevance, a need, and deep meaning in the experience. So now that we've gone through the conditions for motivation, I want to propose how you may design learning experience with them in mind. Teachers and librarians share a common love of information and stories. We want to create or become the reference, the source by which knowledge is discovered or gained. As teachers, we naturally gravitate towards explanation and posting information and content. If that's how you design learning, or if that's the most appropriate way to design in the particular learning you have to impart, then mixed realities are not for you. You can't harness their motivation potential if you create two-dimensional information displays that don't at least suggest movement across space and time, even if it is the immediate, present, actual reality. However, if you truly want to leverage the motivational potential of mixed realities, then you should wrap your mind around the concept that you will be designing an experience, not just another information source. To design an experience, you must have several ingredients that you cannot compromise on or shortchange. The first one is target the demographic you know best and give them what they need, not what you think they want. Number two. Have a specific and direct purpose for learning that is easily discernible, even stated outright to any potential learner. Number three, create relevance through a story or real life situation embedded in the experience, somewhat like getting the learner to star in their own adventure. Number four, start them off easy with a built-in tutorial or onboarding. And five, stimulate as many of the senses as possible, and those like touch and smell, which are not currently possible with the technology, recreated with imagery, both through color and words. In conclusion, designing an experience to leverage mixed realities will sustain a learner's attention beyond the initial novelty. While I provided mainly Second Life examples in this presentation, given the setting of this conference, the concepts are transferable across any mixed reality tool or application. As long as you have some control and know how to be able to design the experience, you can leverage this information to truly motivate learning. Thank you for letting me share these ideas with you today.